Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this first edition of the European Prostate Cancer Awareness Day. It's great to see that so many have joined. Um, we have had over a uh, thousand registrations, and that's far more than we usually have in the European Parliament. Um, since many, uh, we have limited the video and voice features for panelists only. But that doesn't mean that you can ask any questions. Um, we encourage you to post your questions via the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And uh, after each session, my co-moderator Eric Breers and myself will select a couple of questions that will be addressed live. All other questions will be answered after the meeting and a full, full Q&A will be uploaded to the EPAC website. And also there you will find uh, all the recordings of this uh, session and each one of the presentations. Um, since we have a very full program ahead, I'll head over to you, Eric, uh, for further introductions. Thank you, Jarka. I'm, I thank the EAU to invite me to be a moderator because I'm a patient. And as a patient, the focus of this session, early detection, is really close to my heart. And I am an example that uh, early detection can be successful. 19 years ago, I was 50. Just a dirt cheap and simple PSA test that detect issues with my prostate, which in six months led to the discovery of a high-risk prostate cancer. It was successfully treated by surgery by one of the panelists, you can guess. And since then, I have a good health. And this is only possible, this good health, by detecting this cancer early. But for that, we have to go through this effort. And that's why this meeting and this uh, uh, group of excellent speakers are so important to bring us to what we hope will be introduced very soon, which is early detection of prostate cancer. So I now hand over to our two MEP chairs because they will introduce our speakers. And this is Timo Wilken and Tomislav Sokol. So I hand it over to, the, to Timo. Okay, hello everyone. I hope you can hear me. So um, I'm very happy to be able to co-host this event uh, tonight. And I think it's inexcusable uh, that very little is performed at EU level for this uh, very common cancer. 450,000 European men are diagnosed each year with this and 170,000 men are dying from it. So having personally led the, uh, the Let's Talk Prostate Cancer in initiative on advanced prostate cancer and heard firsthand from patients uh, about all the serious and life-changing challenges associated with this condition in this later stage, both for patients and their families, it is really valuable to have this event on early detection. Early detection means this condition can be cured or managed without un, uh, unbearable side effects. And this must be included in the early diagnosis work on the EU cancer plan. Uh, Professor Hein van Poppel from the European Association of Urology will start the first panel session and, the set, and set the scene for us on why uh, early detection of prostate cancer is so important. Thank you, Timo, and also thank you to uh, Tomislav Sokol for hosting this meeting. Uh, I'm happy to setting the scene and actually telling the sad story of PSA. Uh, indeed, I believe that, as uh, Timo just mentioned, prostate cancer in our society is really an important and prevalent disease. It is the most common male cancer. One in seven men in Europe will develop prostate cancer before the age of 85. And before we had PSA, and PSA is actually a protein that we can sample in the blood where it does not belong because it belongs in the sperm and in the ejaculate. But before we had it, one out of three up to one out of two men died of it. And in 2018, I said before, 107 men died. So it's not a non-killing disease. And PSA was introduced in the 80s, and you see immediately what has been the consequence. For a certain while, there have been many, many prostate cancers detected, while in general, you see after this initial increase of overdiagnosis, there is 
an increase in need in prostate cancer incidence. But at the same time, after a couple of years, you see that the mortality is coming down. So when prostate cancer could be detected early, mortal mortality will be less. And you see, if you compare to all the different other cancers listed here, for instance, bladder, how has the mortality uh, gone since a couple of years? It has about not diminished while in prostate cancer, no cancer did actually better in changing the mortality rates. So we know that early detected disease can be perfectly cured. The treatment of early disease has less side effects. If you need to operate or irradiate a larger tumor, you have obviously more side effects. So the patients detected early have a better quality of life, will suffer less incontinence and impotence, and the cost is reasonable, in total about 25,000 euros. If you come to more advanced disease because you detect the patients too late, you will have more side effects, poor quality of life, and often it does not cure. And for the last two to three years, it will cost to the health uh, services 250,000 euros. So, but PSA actually has become victim of its own success because it diagnosed too many cancers. And so testing was discouraged. And it was told very commonly, you will die with prostate cancer, not from prostate cancer. And we know that treatment can lead to very unpleasant side effects, simply because prostate cancer diagnosis automatically led to active treatment. And I know from my own experience, when I've been doing surgery on 3,000 patients, certainly in the beginning of my experience, 10% of them, I offered them surgery while they did not deserve it yet at that moment. These patients today would go for active surveillance and not for active treatment. But we were unable to discriminate between significant and insignificant cancers. And this has raised a worldwide anti-PSA testing propaganda. But what has been the consequence? The consequence has been that today you see that prostate cancer is killing more men than breast cancer kills women. And this is in the UK, increase of 17% in 10 years. In Germany, prostate kills more men than colorectal cancer kills. After lung, that is still the most common. Lung being a preventable disease. So there is another strategy to follow. In the US, aggressive cancer, metastatic disease at the time of diagnosis has increased because of too late diagnosis following the propaganda against uh, PSA testing. And finally, if you look here that in brown, prostate cancer mortality has come down over the years dramatically. This decline has come to a stop and now there is an increase. And also in the United States, there's a 5% increase in prostate cancer mortality in just one year. And we just let it happen. Nothing is undertaken. We do something about cervix, about colorectal and breast, but nothing for men with prostate cancer. And times have changed. We are today able to avoid overdiagnosis because we use PSA in the better way. We have risk calculators and we have multiparametric MRI before biopsy. It means that a suspicious PSA does not mean immediately a biopsy and all the consequences. And we can also reduce the overtreatment because we apply active surveillance in today 65% of low and intermediate risk prostate cancer patients. Now, we need to have a new early detection strategy because there is not only quality of life gain, mortality decrease, but also savings. While a PSA costs 10 euro, multiparametric MRI 136, this is Belgium. It might be more expensive, uh, for instance, in the UK and in Germany, but it's, it's not outrageous. Early detected disease can be treated for 15,000 euros. And if we would do early detection using MRI and risk calculators, we will do less biopsies, have less complications, less overdiagnosis, no costly treatment of the advanced disease, less prostate cancer death so that people can continue to contribute during their professional lifespan and better quality of life. 
So thank you for listening. I hope this is indeed setting the scene and I look forward to the other speakers. Thank you very much, Timo Workin. Yes, thank you very much for this introduction. And uh, I uh, have seen my colleague so uh, we will change the order of speakers slightly. And I now uh, give the floor to Mr. Sokol, uh, one uh, colleague SMEP for his um, yeah, welcome address. And uh, Tomislav, the floor is yours. Thank you, Timo, very much. There was some technical mix up because instead of my name, the name of my assistant was, uh, was shown. So, because I, I already uh, logged in at 5.30. So this was, this was the problem. So I was here the whole time, but okay. Doesn't matter, thank God we sort of the time now. Uh, yes, so, I, uh, so a lot of things about the PSA testing and its importance has been already said by the previous speakers. So I will not repeat it. I will try to tell a bit more about the overall framework of the EU instead. Because we know that definitely the prostate, prostate cancer is a big problem. We know that, for instance, for instance in, my, in my country, uh, in 2017, almost 3,000 people were diagnosed with prostate cancer and uh, uh, 785 died which for Croatia is definitely a big number. And this is, and uh, what is even more, more problematic is that these numbers are on the rise. And early screening, and of course, using the PSA testing has been very important in early detection. But of course, you know that there are some, that there are problems and there is a lack of, unfortunately, of, cons uh, of consensus about uh, how to use them or not. And uh, as was said, uh, this test has become a victim of its own success, uh, so to speak. But what I would like to say about what we can do on EU level about all this. And of course, it is often said that on EU, that, uh, that European Union has, does not have a lot of powers in the area of healthcare. And you know, of course, according to Article 168 of the treaty, that primary competence for organization and financing of health, healthcare systems lies with the member state. However, if you look at what, uh, what concrete powers the European Union has at its disposal, I believe that we can do much more than we are doing now. And uh, definitely uh, the, the new policy shift and the new focus that has been placed on uh, healthcare in general, but especially on beating cancer, at least before the corona uh, pandem pandemic outbreak, has shown us that we really can do a lot. And of course, we as the member of the uh, Special Committee on BP Cancer will try to do a lot in um, raising awareness of this issue. So what, so, that, so what is important? I believe that what, what is crucial is that uh, we take on a holistic approach on how to battle cancer in general and especially prostate cancer. cancer. Of course, we as the European Union cannot impose binding legislation and force member states to adopt the, uh, a special type of campaign of raising awareness. But we have at our disposal a lot of other instruments which can be used to support member states and provide incentives for the member states to, to, uh, to adopt uh, the necessary approach. And, one of, and definitely one of, these, uh, one of these instruments is the new EU for Health program. As you probably know, uh, the last health program of EU in the previous seven-year budget was, uh, around, was, was at around 450 million euros, but now we, as Euro parliamentarians, have been able to to uh, to raise this amount to 5.1 billion euros. Of course, the additional uh, the initial the initial proposal was even larger to raise it to 9.4 billion euros. But now, after having the the, the, the debates and, and the, with the council member states through the council. Commission, we were able to find a compromise which will raise the EU health budget by 12 times when compared to the previous seven years. And I believe this is very important because this can definitely, this can definitely be used to, to, pro to provide financial stimulus to, uh, to raising awareness campaigns and, one of these, and definitely some of these campaigns should be directed towards battling prostate cancer. Also, one additional tool, which is not mentioned uh, that much, which I think is also very important, is the cohesion policy. Because the cohesion policy, as you probably know, uh, has a purpose of reducing inequalities in, in, across the European Union. And, of, and we, we speak of access to healthcare treatment. Obviously, this, uh, there, there are still big differences between different member states of the EU. 
So definitely, uh, definitely a European Union cohesion policy can be used to reduce these inequalities, to invest into health infrastructure, into health personnel and workforce. And definitely this is something that, that is also very important for battling uh, prostate cancer as well. So this, these are the financial instruments which are very important. And of course, we also have regulatory instruments that are disposal. One of these regulatory instruments is which has, is, which has been unfortunately stuck on, by the, uh, on the level of the council because of the opposition of some member states is the HTA, the Health Technology Assessment Re uh, Regulation. And I believe, uh, believe that this piece of legislation is crucial in terms of setting the criteria and benchmarks for uh, for introducing new treatments and new medicines and uh, new screening methods, for instance, within the national within the national healthcare systems. So I hope and I believe that this HDA regulation will also be adopted. Uh, I believe that this will be a definitely a big step forward in terms of providing better healthcare to our citizens. And also, apart from the treatment, apart from prevention and, and early, di early diagnosis, what is, I believe is also very important is the aftermath. So what, so what happens with the survivors? And of course, you know that, that cancer survivors in many cases uh, face discrimination and face big problems in terms of, for instance, access, uh, access to, to insurance and things like that. And, and this is something that definitely should be remedied by the European Union. And actually this area, the rights of survivors, the so-called right to be forgotten, not to be discriminated against because of having, having the cancer before in the previous time period is something where EU actually has clear legislative competence to do it because we have European Union rules on, for instance, on insurance, which can be amended to introduce this, this right to be forgotten rule. So definitely, so this is one area where we can, where we, where we as the European Union can do a lot in terms of uh, influencing national healthcare policies and uh, providing better treatment and better aftercare for, can, for cancer patients and for patients who are who, who suffered from uh, prostate cancer. So to sum up, I'm, I'm, I'm honored that, you, that, uh, that uh, I'm part of, part of this conference. I'm glad that we are also using these possibilities to raise awareness about this topic within the European Parliament and with the general public. And I believe that we as, as members of the European Parliament can do a lot in term, within the already existing EU competences to provide better, better prevention, better screening, better early detection, better treatment and better aftercare for all the cancer survivors and especially for prostate cancer. And I will be and the, what, we, what is important that we, what we will try to do also is to listen to the to, to science, to listen to experts. We are doing this already within our uh, Becca committee, the committee on, on battling cancer. And I'm glad that we are having these kinds of discussions for, uh, for us to also hear what the main problems are, where, where still there is lack of consensus, and to try to get all of the opinions to make uh, relevant policy decisions. So thank you very much for giving me the floor. Thank you very much. And uh, we are happy that you're here. And as the rapporteur for the uh, HTA file, I'm happy that you mentioned this very important uh, instrument. But now I think let's have a look at the research side. And I think research on uh, this topic is very crucial. So I'm very happy to have uh, Professor Monique Robol, and I'm very sorry for pronouncing your name, uh, here with us, who has spent uh, the last 20 years uh, researching prostate cancer. She is based in the Erasmus University in the Netherlands and is a principal investigator for the European randomized study on off screening for prostate cancer. Uh, which is the largest ever randomized study on screening for prostate cancer. So we are re really happy to have you here with us. And I'm now handing over the mic directly to you. Thank you. Thank you. And good evening to all listening uh, to this very important uh, session. My name is Asset Monique Robo. I'm a professor in decision making in urology. And I'm working at the Erasmus University in Rotterdam. And in the next seven minutes, I will try to give you an overview of the effect of PSA-based screening, prostate cancer, incidence, morbidity, and mortality. So first, let us go back to the early 90s, when prostate cancer was considered a deadly disease for many men diagnosed in the situation that has driven urologists to search for earlier and better methods of detection. And please be aware that if we now should stop 
is in this work on prostate cancer screening. The situation will soon be reflective for contemporary daily clinical practice again. So in the early 90s, several randomized screening studies start to assess the effect of PSA testing on prostate cancer mortality. One of the studies was the PLCO study in the US, a 10 center study where men aged 55 to 70 years were invited for screening with PSA and rectal examination. Screening was done every year for a six year period. After that, there was follow up on incidence and mortality in both arms of the trial. Of notice that a lot of men were already pre-screened before entering the trial, and that also during the trial, many men in the control arm actually were screened. It is obvious that this will affect the power to detect an effect of the intervention. And this cannot be corrected anymore. It is then not surprising that after a median follow-up of 15 years, no effect of PSA screening on prostate cancer mortality is seen in the PLCO trial. In the same period, in Europe, two randomized screening trials were started. This slide shows information on the Göteborg screening trial. The randomized trial of 20,000 men aged somewhat younger as the PLCO 50 to 64 year. These men were screened every two years during a period of 40 years. This intense screening country, a uh, screening program in a country where PSA testing was certainly not common at the time of the trial, showed after 18 years of follow-up an impressive, highly significant 35% reduction in prostate cancer mortality. This reduction means that to avoid one man dying from prostate cancer, 231 men need to be screened and compared to a clinical situation, 10 extra diagnoses would result. Finally, the largest prostate cancer screening trial, the ERSPC, initiated in Europe in 1993 and including more than 182,000 men aged 55 to 70. The majority of men were screened with a four-year interval during a period of eight to 16 years. A PSA testing outside the trial was no issue before randomization and was low to intermediate during the period men were actively screened. After 16 year follow-up, the ESPC also showed a highly statistically significant mortality reduction of 20%. This reduction translates into a number needed to screen and diagnose of 570 and 80. In summary, the well-designed and conducted European randomized trials clearly show that PSA-based screening leads to a reduction in men dying from prostate cancer. But there is more to gain. Detailed data from ERSPC Rotterdam provide insight in comorbidity in the form of suffering from metastatic disease. The detailed data provides an opportunity to assess the net benefit of PSA-based screening and having the availability of detailed data, data from an early pilot study. We have empirical evidence, so no statistical modeling, on the long-term effects of PSA screening. First, the effect on metastatic disease. This slide shows the most recent data of ERSPC Rotterdam, based on data of more than 42,000 men with a median follow-up of 18 years now. The data show an impressive reduction in men suffering from metastatic disease when being screened. This reduction already starts four years after the first screening and is with current follow-up now 41%. This translates into a considerable gain in quality adjusted life years. In a screening trial, there is always men that do not attend when randomized to screening and men that will be screened when randomized to the control arm. 
ERSPC Rotterdam knows this so-called non-attendance and contamination at an individual level, which enables us to calculate the net benefit of screening. Comparing both groups according to their randomization status results in ERSPC Rotterdam in a mortality reduction of 32%. Correcting for non-attendance and screening ongoing in the control arm, we get the net benefit of PSA-based screening, which is impressive. Prostate cancer mortality in men screened every four years over a period of 12 to 16 years is half of the mortality of men not screened at all. Many prostate cancer deaths can be avoided if this data is extrapolated to the European Union. Finally, a cohort that started screening already in 1991. Although small in size, the data confirm our observation of the large ERSPC trial. Here, a 53% prostate cancer mortality reduction and a 58 reduction in men suffering from metastatic disease where again, the effect on less metastatic disease is obvious early after screening. Effect on mortality reduction is as expected three to four years later. This data mean that a few conclusions can be made without any doubt. Data from the pre-PSA era show that prostate cancer is a disease often related to a lot of suffering over a considerable time period. Two out of three men died of their disease. Organized screening with the use of the PSA test reduces suffering and dying from prostate cancer and potential harms in the form of unnecessary testing, overdiagnosis and overtreatment can be largely avoided with the current knowledge and tools. So to summarize, it is time to organize all relevant stakeholders and start implementing our knowledge to avoid further suffering and lives lost. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. And um, as we are slightly behind the schedule, I will now directly uh, hand over to Professor uh, Behrens, a radiologist from Radboud University Medical Center who is a world expert on the use of medical, uh, medical imaging for the detection of urological cancers such as prostate cancer. And um, what can you tell us about the role of MRI and radio radiology in detecting prostate cancer? Thank you very much. Um, well, let's first have a discussion, uh, a quick explanation, what actually is multiparametric MRI? Multiparametric MRI is the integration of three techniques that help each other. The first technique is anatomy, also, also called T2 weighted imaging. This, this shows the structure of the prostate just like a drawing. The only difference between the drawing and the MRI is the color. You can see a detailed anatomy in the peripheral and the transition zone in this axial prostate projection. The second thing is we need something to differentiate cancer from hematoma, from inflammation and from benign hyperplasia. Because on the anatomic images, all these structures are gray. And this second technique is called diffusion weighted imaging, showing the biology of prostate cancer and normal structures. In low-grade cancer and normal structures, there's a lot of space in between the cells. And that means that um, the velocity of water is high. Whereas in cancer, the cells are tightly packed and there the velocity is low. And on this so-called ADC map, you can plot this speed. And when the speed is low, it's black. And this means high cell density. And this means cancer. The other technique we have is contrast. If you give contrast, cancer enhances, but also normal, uh, sorry, prostatitis and 
normal benign hyperplasia. So this is a very sensitive technique, but not very specific. And the combination of these three techniques uh, give the diagnosis. Why should we use prostate MRI? Four level of 1A evidence papers showed that we have to perform MRI before biopsy. These are the four papers. And let's zoom in into this one, the Cochrane Library Analysis. A lot of patients, many studies. In one third of the patients, biopsy can be avoided. The missed rate of significant cancer is only 8%. And now this is important. There is a significant reduce, reduction of overdiagnosis from 28 to 17%, with an equal detection of significant cancers. If you look at the 4M study, you see that this is even better. There is an avoidance of biopsy of 50% and a miss rate of only three. So 97% of significant cancers are detected and a reduction of overdiagnosis in almost half of the patients with an equal detection of significant cancers. These resulted in a change of the EAU guidelines in 2019 that prescribed prostate MRI to be performed before biopsy. Now, what is the potential role of MRI in early detection? As you have heard by the previous speakers, there is a clear no to PSA-based screening. Why? Because there is a lot of overdetection, too many biopsies, and this is um, a lot, uh, so the, 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 the bad things are a lot um, more than the mortality and the morbidity reduction. Now, if you now combine PSA with a risk calculator and MRI, this certainly will make the balance better. So PSA followed by the risk calculator can be done by an iPhone and the MRI, the manogram, is the technique, are the techniques for the future. Now you can see that the pros are a much higher compared to the contrast because of the reduced overdetection and reduced rate of biopsies. What are the challenges of early detection programs? First, the reading must be optimized. Well, this has been done by the introduction of the PIRATS system. Second, you have to enable good quality MRI. Good quality MRI need to have quality control programs. And this is the first paper recently published in European Radiology that made the first step towards quality control in prostate cancer MRI. Also, there need to be a focus on the learning and the certification by urologists and radiologists. Unfortunately, this is happening. This was before the time of COVID, but now a lot of webinars are presented as well. Now, how can we scan all men? First of all, we need to reduce the number of sequences. So a fast MRI protocol, the so-called manogram. You can do within 10 minutes, you can do the MRI with the cost of lower than 100 euros. Second, if we apply artificial intelligence for the diagnosis, this will help to report the high burden of prostate cancer MRIs for the radiologist. Now, if we want to prevent the harm of no or of an opportunistic screening, then we need to set up an early detection program in the EU. And with risk calculators and MRI, this becomes possible. What do we need to do? First of all, we need to standardize and synchronize the data within the EU, uniform data sets. We should collect these data sets and have them freely available for industries which want to test their artificial intelligence and other improving techniques. And third, we need to set up a multi country prospective trial in Europe. In men who have an elevated PSA, risk calculator, followed by MRI if positive, and then 
biopsy if positive, and all the negative men will have a follow-up of a safety net. This is the new proposed scheme for a multi-country prospective trial. And now the answer of is early detection of prostate cancer possible? The answer is yes, we scan. Thank you for your attention. So thank you for your very interesting intervention. And we now have time for a few questions, perhaps. Please use the Q&A for your questions. And don't forget, those that cannot be answered here today will be answered on our web page. So first question goes to Hain. And for Hain, we have a question from one in the audience. He is asking one of the big questions, which is how can we get our general practitioners to go for early detection and to use PSA? I think this is an absolutely relevant and important question where we need to give an answer. And you know that we have recently taken contact with Wonka, which is the World Organization of GPs, because there is still a lot of reluctance in many countries where GPs refuse to take PSA sampling in their patients, even if they ask it for having PSA tested. Uh, the fact is actually that it is still around that PSA leads to uh, overdiagnosis and treating of patients that do not deserve treatment, that would not die from the disease and never suffer from it. But as I have shown you, the, uh, the propaganda against this PSA testing has led to an increasing mortality. And this is what GPs today need to know, that the latest update, epidemiological update from uh, big countries like Germany, the UK, the United States, you see that the mortality is increasing. The number of too late diagnoses increases, and this will be reflected in and, and more and more people dying from prostate cancer in the years to come. So we really need to make them aware that we cannot continue just watching it and not doing anything. And therefore, early detection using the modern tools is probably the way out of it. Thank you for the question. Thank you, Hein. I have a, a short question perhaps for Monique because we always want to detect prostate cancer, but the best way is not to have prostate cancer. Are there any ways to prevent prostate cancer? Sorry, there are certainly studies ongoing uh, for the prevention of prostate cancer, but these are preliminary and it, it turned out to be very hard to prevent prostate cancer. We know that there are risk factors associated with prostate cancer, mainly related to diet. And there are studies known that people that uh, emigrate to countries where a lot of meat is eaten, that then suddenly there's a rise in uh, prostate cancer incidence that is mainly related to red meat. And also we know if we look in Europe, where we have uh, a difference in incidence and mortality going from the north of Europe over to the south of Europe, there's a decline in incidence and mortality going south. But that has to do with uh, the diet being, uh, namely the tomatoes. Uh, so we have done some dietary studies, but it is extremely difficult to get real hard level one evidence on that. So for now, in the case of prostate cancer, uh, I think uh, secondary prevention screening is the way uh, to go, yes. Thank you. Thanks, Monique. That's very interesting to hear. Um, something to watch for later. Um, we are a bit of a tight schedule, so I'll quickly hand over to uh, Timo Welcome to introduce the next speaker. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, I'll directly hand over to André uh, on behalf of uh, yeah, the um, European Prostate Cancer Organization, Europe UOMO. Uh, to take us through the first patient-driven study on quality of life. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay. Well, uh, I'd like to give you an overview today what the real effect of treatment in prostate cancer means for patients. 
First of all, I'm Andrew Eddie Shaw. I'm the chairman of the Patient Coalition, Europa Homo. I'm a patient as well. And also like Eric, uh, I thanks my life that I'm sitting here is because I luckily detected my prostate cancer early. So what was the study? The study was done at the end of last year. The results are just mm -hmm. uh, analyzed now. And it's the first ever survey in prostate cancer from patients for patients. We designed the questionnaire, which was a 20 minutes online survey for men who had a treatment in prostate cancer. Not unimportant, it was available in 19 languages so that any patient could answer in his own mother tongue. We used three validated questionnaires and of course, due to GDPR, the responses were anonymous. Here you can see the geographical response, uh, 25 countries and the darker the color on the map, the more responses we had from that uh, country. First conclusion, prostate cancer is not an old man's disease. If you look at the age as at uh, the diagnosis, the average is 64 years. And if you consider a 70 year man, old man still active and not old, then 76% is confronted with a diagnosis of prostate cancer before being 70. And by the way, 50% of them are diagnosed uh, in a metastatic phase. Now, how does treatment affect your quality of life? It's very clear that your sexual function is affected by treatment the most, uh, followed by urinary incontinence. Now, here you see in the, in the following slides that I'm going to show you that if you are in a metastatic phase, your quality of life is much more affected than in a, an early stage of the disease. This is, this is so for pain and uh, discomfort. Those are the treatments here, radiotherapy and ADT and chemotherapy that are often used in the later stages. So you see a substantial increase in percentage of uh, patients who have problems. Same with tiredness, yeah. same with insomnia. And this is a very important point. Insomnia was not seen as an effect of prostate cancer uh, treatment, but after our survey, you see that 24% uh, if you receive radiotherapy and ADT, and more than, or around 30% if you have uh, chemotherapy. Similarly, for the mental health, uh, that's going down uh, if you are treated in a later stage. Now, what is also an effect is anxiety and depression. So you see here that 42% of the men say they are anxious or depressed if treated in, with uh, uh, prostate cancer. Now let's, let's have a closer look at the sexual function. Uh, you see that radiotherapy, and that's contradictory with all the other clinical studies in clinical environments that we've seen, but all patients say that radiotherapy is related to worse quality of life than prostatectomy, Although you see that both treatments are affecting your quality of life uh, to a big extent, especially if you look at that age that the reference group scores nearly 56. Men see that also as a big problem. Half of the men, although they are considered to be old, half of the men responding said that sexual function has been a moderate to a big problem after the treatment for them. Looking at incontinence, you see that prostatectomy is related to worse quality of life than radiotherapy here. Uh, the reference group scores 90, and you see that men treated by prostatectomy score much lower. And what does that mean for patients? Well. 37% of men use 
one or more incontinence pads every day after treatment for prostate cancer. And you see that the reference group in the age group uses only 7%. So there is a 30% increase of men using pads after treatment for prostate cancer. What are my, my take home messages for you? First of all, active surveillance should be considered as the first treatment in order to assure quality of life if it can be applied safely, of, of course. And the second one is early detection is key. I've showed you, I think, that on a lot of aspects of the quality of life, quality of life is much worse in the later stages. And where are we today? Well, first of all, the awareness of men, less than 50% of all the men in Europe know that they have a prostate and they must take care of it. And the support for early detection is only 50%. You see here on the map in which countries it is supported or not. But this, gentlemen and ladies, this is a shame. This shouldn't be the case. Do not forget, men die from prostate cancer, 107,000 each year. Men suffer from prostate cancer, as I've showed you. And policymakers, please, you must change that. Thank you. Andre, thank you very much. This was very helpful and insightful. And I will now give the floor to Sarah from Movember which is a charity that holds a moustache growing event during November that raises fund and awareness for prostate can cancer and men's health. Sarah, what are the main lessons you at Movember have learned over the years about raising awareness of prostate cancer? Hi, thank you. Sorry, I'm just jumping ahead of my own presentation. Um, Hi, and Sarah kindly asked me to join you today. It's a slight change of tone um, to talk about Movember and the role we play, I guess, in changing the face of men's health in our fine month that is November. You hopefully have seen some sporting moustaches around you over the course of the last couple of weeks. Um, why do we get men to grow moustaches around the world? Because men die six years earlier than women. Um, and we know, as has just been discussed, prostate cancer is one of those largest killers with nearly 10 million men today living with prostate cancer around the world. Testicular cancer is still a common cancer, the most common cancer amongst young men. And the other area of focus for November is mental health and suicide prevention with three quarters of all suicides being men. What are we wanting to do about it? What are we aiming to achieve? By 2030, November's goals are really simple, although audacious and ambitious. We want to see a 50% reduction in deaths from prostate and testicular cancer. We want to see a quarter of reduction in the rate of male suicide. And we want to see a 50% reduction in the number of men experiencing ongoing mental and physical side effects from cancer treatment. So how are we going to get there? We are a global charity um, uniquely positioned to catalyze innovation and foster collaboration across multiple markets and disciplines to really achieve faster outcomes. And that's been the ambition of the organization since its inception in 2003. We try and meet men where they are to achieve greater outcomes with speed and support them in taking care of themselves by giving men the facts, providing them with the tools, changing their behavior for the better, funding breakthrough research and influencing service models so they work better for men. And I'm just gonna play you a little video for those of you that are not as familiar with Movember or maybe not across all of the work we do, I had a quick intro for you.
our focus over the last 17 years has really been to build those sustainable approaches to change. And so that money raised has been invested in four ways, biomedical research, the space of prevention, which we're largely talking around today, an early intervention, and then treatment and care. And I guess I, I wanted to take the, the short opportunity to really talk firstly about the, I mean, obviously there's the, the money that's raised has done a fantastic um, amount and, and we're joined today with some, some of the researchers who've been funded by Movember over the years. We've invested a significant amount in the treatment of prostate cancer, both the understanding of the disease as well as how to further and advance uh, men's outcomes when it comes to prostate cancer. And likewise, we've been really fortunate to have a huge amount of money to invest in mental health and suicide prevention, testicular cancer and health promotion more generally. But beyond that, I guess what we've had is the power of an audience. And that audience has largely been built on the ethos of having some fun and doing some good. It's how we roll. And it's what we set out to achieve from our early days. And the moustache becomes that bastion of, of um, change, of men being able to stand up and look different, stand out for a good cause, um, and, and really ask people to support them. And that journey is, is every man's around the world. We've done a job in building a brand and we're recognised as a movement and a brand. And I think that's been a really important part of the, the way in which we've harnessed the attention of so many people in supporting men's health. And we've had a lot of ambassadors and those ambassadors become role models for change. Men who are willing to stand up and say the current status quo is not good enough when it comes to men's health. So all of that fun is really how we lead. And then I kind of wanted to give you a quick couple of examples as to how we then take that fun and we convert it into real change uh, and, and, and effect for, through our community. So once people sign up at Movember.com and they make that commitment to grow, we then serve them up language and messaging with, to arm them through the month because people are gonna ask them why they're growing, um, why grow a silly looking moustache in November. And so giving them key facts and information and action has always been a really important part of that. So right up front, our key messaging is very much in the space of, of early intervention, early detection being key, giving them those straight up facts they need to know about the risks they face being either that being age, ethnicity, or family history, and I guess what I was really keen to understand, um, having been around since the beginning, was are we, are we making any change here? Are, are the men who are participating actually doing the things we wanted them to do? So this year we actually undertook a bit of a global survey. We did um, a cohort of our own community of men and we matched it against a general population through a YouGov sample of about 7,500 men. And whilst we can't prove cor direct correlation, um, causation, sorry, we can show some early signs of correlation between men and the information we're serving them up throughout the month. We learned that our men, our MoBros, are more, are more aware of the risks they face of prostate cancer and have taken action to speak to a doctor about those risks, with 48% of our Movember community um, taking that action over the, who are over the age of 45 versus less than 20% of the general male population. We see that our men of them, 76% of them know that being over 50 is a major risk factor. 82% of them know family history is a risk factor. And nearly 20% of them know ethnicity is a risk factor. So to the points made in some of the earlier presentations, arming men with the risks they face and understanding those risks is probably the first step in getting them to take action. We've been working um, over the last five years to really highlight to young men the issue of testicular cancer, and that really the, the matter is in their own hands to detect. And so unlike prostate cancer, testicular cancer is a much simpler disease. It's a very clear diagnostic and treatment pathway. And so our messaging can be really simple and fun here. We've been running a Know Thy Nuts campaign for five years within the Movember community. And again, those same survey results show a real uptake in that information and that change in action taking. So we see 80% of our own community checking their testicles on a regular basis, which is a fantastic result. In the midst of COVID, we see social connection and relationships declining, and in particular for men, because we know these are difficult things to, to hold on to. So we see men adapt, going to more maladaptive coping behaviours. So we see men sleeping more, comfort eating, drinking more alcohol, doing the things that we know we don't want them to do. And in a recent survey, we saw that 
in the midst of COVID, less than half of men had actually been asked how they were doing. How are, they, are they having a difficult time during this moment? With 83% of those same men saying that they found it really helpful when people asked them how they're doing. And 30%, a third of the men we, we surveyed around the world said they'd had a weakening in their relationships with friends and colleagues. So we know this moment in time is having its impact. We launched Movember Conversations in the midst of the pandemic, which is a digital online tool to support those who'd like to ask a man how he's doing and have richer and more helpful conversations. And again, I think we see that Mobros, through the same study, our participants are more than twice as likely to talk to family or friends if they're struggling with their mental health, which is just another fantastic result. So I, I, I expect that... Um, we, we will continue to see improved results throughout the campaign. We know that our men become walking, talking billboards for men's health. So if you see a moustache walking by you this month, give it a nod, give it a smile. It is certainly having its impact on the face of men's health. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah, for these very interesting insights. And uh, this is very motivating for all of us. For all of us. And uh, now I would hand back to Professor von Poppel uh, with the following question. Is there an emerging scientific consensus on what we have heard from previous speakers? Thank you again, Timo. Uh, the EAU has been uh, putting quite some effort in the last years and uh, uh, to develop an algorithm for early detection, which is acceptable for those that are sometimes against prostate cancer screening, also for those that are feared to get prostate cancer one day. And the initiatives that the EAU has taken first is to inform the patient. We need awareness, this is one thing. The second thing we need is to give exact informing to patients that have a question, do I need have to have my PSA tested or not? What are the consequences? What are the possible negative aspects? We have made guidelines for the uh, professionals, for the healthcare providers, and we have been doing, uh, trying at least to influence the policymakers by writing a number of white papers. The latest of one, I will come back to it, uh, we, that we have written with support of Europa Wulmo, of ECPC, and of Movember, for instance. How to eliminate the second major killer of a man in Europe, uh, we have designed an algorithm that I'm going to present, but that I have presented and worked and reshaped and discussed with many instances, with EPAC, uh, with ICPC, with, uh, as you can see, we were in Helsinki, in Budapest, in Bucharest. We have had a number of EPADs last year to each time draw attention to what we have to do. We are not advocating that every uninformed man gets a PSA sample taken when he's 45, 50 or 60. No, what we want is a risk stratified early detection. This means if you are between 50 and 59 and your PSA is lower than one, and this is around 50% of the man, you do not need to have a PSA next month or next year, have another PSA at five years. If the PSA is higher, okay, we will have a PSA check in two to four years. If you are older, okay, we have time and we will delay your next. But if it is higher than three, and it's a rather low value because we do not want to miss very aggressive tumors that sometimes have a low PSA, and this is 10% of this population, then we're going to use risk calculators, risk factors, like African-American origin, family history, your father, your dad, your uncle has had prostate cancer, your brother, the volume of the prostate, uh, age-related PSA, and with these risk calculators, you will be assigned in a group that is having low risk or high risk for having prostate cancer. So this is a complete change of a blunt PSA taken in every man, and when it's abnormal, you go for a biopsy. This has been completely uh, changed, and this is a very complex graph, but I just want to draw your attention. This is the group of people, men that have healthy men that have a PSA above three. Instead of giving them biopsies, we will do this reflex testing, as I just said. And if they are low risk, they just go for clinical follow-up. And we know how to do that. And it's well described. If they're high risk or intermediate risk, 
then they will all have a multi-parametric MRI. And following the result of this, in the end, they will either be low risk again and have clinical follow-up or be high risk and then maybe have the diagnosis of prostate cancer. And of these 100% men that have an MRI, in the end, 35 will have prostate cancer. But one fourth of these, we will be able to offer them safely active surveillance and not active treatment. So we keep their quality of life. We keep their quantity of life. We do not take risks on eventual mortality of the disease. So of this high and intermediate risk that have prostate cancer, we know how to avoid over treatment. So how do we now want to bring this? We want to bring this to the EU beat cancer plan and our recommendations in the white paper that we have written and that we will launch as, as from today is use PSA testing properly. Well-informed man, 45 to 50, with or with a life expectancy up to uh, 10 years, not stop at 70. We have the risk calculators, age-related PSA, PSA density, and there have been four or five questions from the audience on biomarkers. This will it even make better but we do not have these biomarkers available everywhere and they are expensive. And I do not want us to wait for having these biomarkers before starting early detection. And obviously MRI, the big game changer. Biopsy those at risk for significant cancer. Treat actively only those that have a risk to die from prostate cancer and that we can properly identify today and manage with active surveillance, those with low and some with intermediate risk. And this is our recommendation to the EU beat cancer plan. If they take it seriously, and you do not take into account the most common male cancer and the second male killing cancer, that would really not be fair. This way we will decrease mortality, improve the quality of life of the prostate cancer patient and substantially decrease the cost. So to conclude, if you allow me, Early detection saves lives. There is no doubt, no discussion. We do not need new trials to really show that. The prostate cancer deaths that we still face today and that will increase in the years to come still because we detected too late so many patients can rather easily be dramatically reduced. Our adult male population and the GPs, another question from Ken Masters, need to be informed. We can say today to a young man, if you do not want to die from prostate cancer, we cannot prevent you to get it, but we can make that you do not die from it. No, non-uninformed mass screening, a well-informed healthy man today should be offered early detection. And this is what we need to feed in, in the Europe's beat. Cancer. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm sorry that I have to jump in here, but <laughs> we are running out of time. So, um, but I don't know if you're aware, but in your picture, there are now three commissioners as our colleague McGuinness is no more an MEP, but a commissioner. So a very good snap uh, shot. Um, now let's move on uh, to uh, our last speaker uh, from the industry, um, uh, Dr. Georg Terma from Siemens Healthineers representing COCIR to present his ideas on the industry's role in all this. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and good evening to everybody listening. So it's my pleasure to present the industry role in establishing high quality MRI pathways. And as we have heard already in the talks before, there is an indisputable positive impact on patient care with the MRI-enriched diagnostic pathway. As we have heard, there are four landmark studies which clearly have shown that with MRI, no significant cancers are missed, but overdiagnosis can be reduced. This means with MRI, um, it's possible to identify the men who really will profit from therapy and to minimize the side effects in men not re requiring immediate radical interventions. Besides the scientific evidence which has been collected, also major technological advancements have happened in the last decade. So while 10 years ago, 
prostate MRI meant to have a 45 to 50 or 60 minutes long and uncomfortable examination with a rectal probe positioned in the uh, rectum of the patient. Now the scan times are down to 20 to 30 minutes and the patient really can comfortably lay down on the MRI bed only with a blanket-like coil on the pelvis. The scientific and technological advancements taken together already have resulted in a substantial increase of prostate MRI examinations performed in Europe as well as in the United States. And with the more widespread recommendation by the 2019 EIU guidelines to perform MRI before the first biopsy, as we have heard before, we can expect a substantial further increase in the demand. This generally very positive development is, however, also associated with certain challenges. As the Pirate Steering Committee stated, to deliver the intended pathway benefits, the quality of the entire diagnostic process must be ensured. And there are two main challenges. Number one, many centers struggle with optimizing image quality. And number two, also, reader expertise um, is a major issue which potentially can affect clinical care. And this is exactly where we as an industry come into the play and see our main task. We can help to provide high and reproducible quality, ease of use for the technologists performing the MR examinations and to standardize processes. So let's have a closer look at the challenge number one. As I've said, image quality is a confounding factor for report quality in prostate MRI. And today, this is pretty much dependent on the handicraft of the radiographers. So as you can see in this image, this is like an expert photographer who is really tailoring and optimizing the exam for the individual patient. And the good news is that today with machines um, from the industry across vendors, field strengths and platforms, it is possible to acquire high quality images. But as we all know, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. You don't will always have an expert technologist sitting in front of the machine. So what you want is something like my cell phone, which I'm holding up right now, um, because this is something where we as the industry really can help by guiding and assisting the technologist throughout the examination. With such a cell phone, you certainly won't get always the perfect image, but you get consistent image quality and nice images in every case. And this is what we want to provide. And looking for further into the future, as we have heard from Professor Barron's imaging societies, are asked to refine standards and QA um, standards. And we as an industry have ideally to implement automated QA quality assurance procedures. So let's move on to challenge number two. So the second main challenge is associated with reading all the cases. And this is a general problem in radiology. We see a consistent increase in exam numbers while the number of expert radiologists reading the cases remains more or less stable. And in rapidly evolving fields like prostate MRI, this trend and problem is even more pronounced. Here again, we as an industry can significantly contribute. And it's not about replacing a radiologist with an artificial intelligence tool, but it's about to make them perform better read the cases more consistent and to do their work more efficiently. The entire industry is working on tools to identify and classify cancer and then to also seamlessly transfer the radiology information to the urologist who usually performs the biopsy and the treatment. Because as you can all imagine, with a 3D image where you can see a target where to stick a needle into, it's much easier to do such a biopsy procedure 
than with a written prosaic report where a radiologist just describes um, where he sees something. Minimizing the loss of information also brings me to my last point, the importance to aggregate all relevant information as we have heard biomarkers and new tools are on the rise and to enable data-driven decisions tailored to each individual patient and his needs. And again, with the rise of AI tools, data mining and new technologies, we as the industry can play a really important supportive role here to help in this process. So to round it up, with the MR imaging enriched pathway, we are right now at a transition between handicrafts as in the times when books were still handmade and manufacturer work with printing. We are going from a number of highly expertise centers doing imaging and biopsies in Europe to a real multi-centric approach across Europe. And to make this a success, neither the different medical disciplines, policymakers, or the industry alone can go very far. This is something we really have to join forces and work closely together. Thank you. Thank you, Gregor, for this very interesting talk. Um, we see many questions come coming in. Um, do send them in. Um, we, we try to address most of them. Um, we are running a bit short in time. So um, for this Q&A session, we would like to ask one question to uh, Sarah of Movember. Um, Sarah, how can we perform awareness raising without saturating the fear of cancer? How do you deal with this in November? I think this is a question we deal with all the time and it's particularly relevant in mental health as it is in cancer, is walking that fine line between humour and, and the, the, the entry points for men to engage in some of these topics and the reality of the risks that men face. So I think um, humour is important. We know that it breaks down a lot of barriers and I think that light touch in the communication I think clear messaging is so important, not to, not to sort of overly state, but clarity of message, the risks men face, and then the actions that they can take. What can I do about this? What's within my power to affect change and the, and the best outcomes? So that's probably how we, we walk that bridge. Thank you. Um, then I'll head over to um, Amy P. Wilken um, for the second panel. Um, who's coming up next? Yes, thank you very much. Um, we now move on to hear from the European Commission, which is a very important player, as we all know. And uh, we are happy to have with us uh, Dr. Paolo uh, from the uh, Cancer Task Force in DJ Santé. And um, please let us know um, um, if there are potential areas of opportunity for prostate cancer to be addressed. We are really, really grateful for uh, that we can have you with us today. So the floor is yours. Uh, good evening, colleagues. Uh, thanks a lot uh, for the invitation and thanks to the colleague uh, uh, for, uh, for the really interesting, uh, interesting uh, presentation. I will give you a, a, a short presentation of the uh, Europe's uh, beating cancer plan that has been uh, has been already quoted uh, during the previous uh, the, the previous presentation. The EU cancer plan is one of the main priority and flagship initiatives of the European Commission in the area of public health. It's a cross-cutting, a longer-term initiative with many policy areas making important contribution. And despite the significant challenges that posed the coronavirus crisis, the EU Cancer Plan has remained the top priority for the Commission. The Europe's Beating Cancer Plan will address cancer through four pillars. First of all, prevention, early detection, access to diagnosis and treatment, and the quality of life of cancer patients and cancer survivors. To design that the plan will include a combination of measures with tangible and citizen-centered actions designed to make a difference to people across the EU. 
on prevention, just naming a few potential targets, the plan will address consumption of a healthy food, a regular physical activity, and the preventive measure regarding tobacco and alcohol, as well as targeting substances with known cancer risk factors, including exposure to carcinogen in the workplace and the environment, and support the vaccination and treatments to protect against cancer-related infectious agents. Through the focus on cancer prevention and lifestyles, the plan will also benefit other major non-communicable diseases. Cancer early detection is recognized as one of the most important targets of the plan that will provide the new elements to strengthen recommendation on cancer screening and monitor the implementation of cancer screening across the EU. Indeed, in this regard, the new evidence and potential benefit of prostate cancer early detection will be under the radar of the plan and the meeting and discussion, especially on the recent document that you have produced, are ongoing in, in, in the right direction. Strengthening the quality of cancer diagnosis and the access to treatment, including training and continuous education of cancer workforce, will help to ensure that an equal level of cancer care will be reached across the EU reducing the current unacceptable disparity among and within member states. And the last but not the least, the plan will help to improve the quality of life of cancer patients and the cancer survivors through the development of platform structures and resources to support the dissemination of information and the best practices on issue such as a psychological support, self-management, and social integration. The EU Cancer Plan, together with the Mission on Cancer, will also look into the potential of data and the new technology. These have a broad potential in all stages of cancer management. Key is that we have better infrastructures in place to ensure up-to-date and comparable health data that allows us to use it for research purposes. The plan, the European Health Data Space will help to advance on this. It should be underlined that the government and public health authorities alone cannot address the increasing health, social, and economic challenges associated with cancer. And that's why holistic health in health policy and the multi-stakeholder approach is needed to effectively address the impact on cancer prevention and care, and to reduce the growing pressure on health care and social protection system. Europe's beating cancer plan will be based on such approaches including cross-linking the many non-health sector, which will have a concrete impact on cancer prevention and care. Finally, financial support for the different actions through the available EU funding mechanism is currently being discussed, including through the EU for Health program and through other funding streams. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Paolo Giulietti, uh, on behalf of DJ Sante. And uh, after this very excellent summary of the plan, it is really important to understand how this may interact with Horizon Europe's cancer mission. So uh, we are very grateful to welcome Professor Christine Schumian, uh, who is vice chair of the mission board. Um, how can prostate cancer benefit from the initiatives of the EU cancer mission would be our question to you. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, and so it's a pleasure to be able to uh, show to all of you here uh, this second uh, initiative uh, which exists at the uh, 
European Commission, which is the, uh, the, can the cancer mission. So just a few words uh, to be able to uh, show you what this uh, mission approach uh, can bring to uh, research and innovation to fight against cancer. And of course, uh, for here today and for all of you to fight against uh, prostate cancer. So the goals of Horizon Europe missions uh, is uh, in fact to give direction to Europeans research and innovation in solving society's pressing challenges. So of course you understand cancer and of course prostate cancer is uh, important and to produce tangible results. Tangible results which can be seen by the citizens and that can be seen uh, by the patients. And so in order to be able to uh, resolve uh, this issue, it is important to involve citizens and stakeholders more closely, right at the beginning, in setting research priorities. And you will see not only research priorities, but also very much uh, policy actions. And this will lead to equal access for everyone in Europe to the best of European innovation and research resources and global know-how. This concept of mission-oriented approach uh, has been the strategy of uh, Horizon 2020 and now Horizon uh, Europe, uh, and is of course uh, readable in uh, two reports which have been uh, given to the European Commission by Mariana Matsukato, and you see here the, uh, the report. So five Horizon Europe missions uh, have been installed. Uh, you can see right on top here, uh, which is uh, summarized as smart cities, healthy oceans, climate, healthy soils and forests, and one dedicated completely to cancer. So even though all these uh, important uh, challenges and societal challenges are for the well-being of citizens, only one is directly on health, and cancer has been highlighted as the most important issue of health for coming years. So these missions were launched uh, in 2019 at the Research and Innovation Days, which were held still at that time uh, physically. And so as you've seen, uh, the goals of the missions uh, and the goal of the uh, mission-oriented approach is to work closely with citizens and stakeholders in designing research objectives, you can see that it was very important for the mission board, cancer, but also the other uh, mission boards to work closely uh, with the citizens and with stakeholders at the national level of all the EU member states. On the left here, you can see that we have engaged, unfortunately, all this was done virtually uh, with citizens and of course, dealing with cancer, we also had uh, patients and patients carers uh, in these meetings, which were held in the countries and in the national language. When this was not possible, we also held meetings with uh, multiple countries represented. Uh, and of course, there it was most of the time in English. You can see that we managed to get together all citizens and patients representative of all the EU member states. On the right, you can see that we have, uh, as board members, an ambassador function. I, of course, I'm French, and so I'm an ambassador for France, but I'm also an ambassador for Slovenia. So we have met with the local ministries of research, of health, or economics, and education. We've also met with citizens' engagement uh, meetings in these national countries. We've met with the national stakeholders, but also with EU stakeholders, and we've taken into account a multiple of written and published information, such as the one that you are uh, provide, the white paper that you uh, are thinking of, uh, thinking of sending. And so with all these uh, inputs, we hope that we together have produced uh, our mission outline in September of 2020, which reflects not only the work and the wishes of the board members, but of everyone we have consulted. And so we believe that conquering cancer is the mission possible. To follow the guidelines of the mission-oriented approach, we have designed uh, precise targets 
which is by 2030, more than 3 million lives saved, living longer and better. For this, we have five intervention domains, three pillars, prevent what is preventable, optimize diagnostic and treatment, and support quality of life. These three pillars lean on a very solid floor, which is understand. You cannot improve what you do not understand. And all this together reaches up to ensure equitable access, which is of course compulsory. So this is of course a published document. And to be able to uh, achieve uh, this uh, target, uh, the five domains of uh, intervention uh, lean on 13 recommendations, which are going to support uh, the design of very bold action. So these 13 recommendations all of them, I can assure you, hearing all that has been discussed today uh, at this important session, uh, all are in line with what you wish and what you have already done uh, for prostate cancer. I will just highlight uh, a few here in the minutes I have. The, the number one recommendation um, is to understand cancer. Of course, we cannot have improved our screening, early detection, our treatment of cancer and prostate cancer, if we do not understand more what are the initiating events uh, which uh, produces a prostate cancer. We also have uh, screening programs that need to be optimized and to develop novel approaches and early detection. And we have to listen to all you have been wishing and working on so far. We really want to stress also how important it is to develop an EU-wide research program on early diagnostic and minimally invasive treatment and technology in, in line with uh, what you all also wish. It's crucial that we develop an EU-wide research program and policy support to improve the quality of life of cancer patients, cancer survivors, family members and carers, and all persons with an increased risk of cancer. And if I stop here a bit, it's important for us that we need first to be able to define what each cancer patient defines as his quality of life. And the survey that was presented today is the first initial step to be able to design metrics that will be able to validate the interventions that will increase the quality of life because we will be able to scientifically measure the improvement. If we screen, if we detect early, we will have more and more per persons who are faced with maybe the potential of an increased risk of cancer. Those uh, patients or citizens, in fact, need to be able also taken into account. Sharing also, the European Cancer Patient Digital Center approach is also important for us. It's to mean for us, for the cancer patients to be able to have the tools and the uh, data which they will be using to be able to monitor. And I think that, that there's ease, but listening to all of you here also, I've been listening to the word surveillance. And I think this tool will be also important maybe for citizens to be able to monitor this surveillance that you will be that you have been describing. I will also just spend a few more times on the setup of networks of comprehensive cancer infrastructures. We believe that this should exist in all EU member states, and this would be the places where it will be necessary to collect the data, collect the training, collect the expertise in care and also in research. What is important uh, also, of course, accelerate innovation and implementation of new technology. And I will finish by the need to transform cancer culture, communication and capacity building. And I think that of course, November and all your initiatives are important to be able to raise aware awareness, to raise it in a specific, understandable manner that everybody, every citizen can be able to understand. The capacity building is important throughout all these recommendations to fight and to conquer cancer. We will need more people aware, 
of cancer issues. We will need more people to be trained and to be able to perform research, innovation, and care in the best manner to be able to fight cancer. This is going to continue. The mission board work is going to continue in the same manner to be able to continue our stakeholders meeting, to work together with the European Commission and the directorate, with the members of the European Parliament, and of course, with the European Beating Cancer Plan. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Um, we are coming to the end of a very interesting meeting and I would, we will have to limit the number of questions. So one question which I would like to ask to Paolo is what can in fact our clinicians, which is not just urologists and oncologists, all the others and patients in fact do to help the commission and the uh, cancer plan to succeed and to progress? <clears throat> yes, uh, from the very beginning of the designing of the of the roadmap uh, that has been presented in 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 February uh, this year, there was a continuous consultation uh, with the stakeholders, and the stakeholder included uh, uh, also organization representing uh, patients, uh, cancer survivor, and uh, uh, citizens. Uh, this kind of consultation has been uh, uh, in some way, uh, I would say, not uh, stopped, uh, but uh, suffered uh, by, by the coronavirus uh, uh, crisis. Uh, but uh, I would say that uh, we manage uh, to continue uh, to this uh, interchange and this discussion uh, with, uh, with our stakeholders that are, uh, that are now concretizing uh, in uh, the consolidation of the public uh, consultation uh, that uh, we launched uh, after the, 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 the launching uh, of, of the roadmap on, uh, on the cancer plan. Uh, now we are confident that uh, uh, the results of this public uh, consultation might uh, drive a better uh, targeted uh, consultation that uh, will continue uh, in, the, in the next uh, weeks. And uh, uh, of course, uh, we are always in contact uh, with uh, uh, patients, uh, uh, stakeholders that uh, have been uh, uh, really instrumental in, in building and paved the way to the, to, the, to the current initiatives. Thank you. Yarka? Yes, thank you. Um... Mr. Um, I have one quick last question for Professor Shomien, if that's still okay. I was wondering, um, what will the research mission look like uh, when it is agreed? Uh, will there still be calls for proposal like Horizon 2020? So the, uh, the calls for Horizon um, Europe um, are going to follow the manner of uh, the calls of Horizon, uh, of, uh, Horizon 2020. Um, the, the way that the precise actions uh, resulting from the thinking and the work of the mission uh, still need to be defined. Uh, for the moment, uh, we have work that has been designed for us to continue our uh, implementation uh, for the next six months. Uh, so it's probably expected that the actions that will come will probably be in the Horizon uh, Europe program in 2021. Uh, but we do not, of course, um, separate uh, Horizon Europe calls. And the, uh, we do separate uh, the mission call actions and the uh, calls from Horizon uh, Europe. Thanks a lot. Then I'll head over to uh, Timo Wilken for the last remarks, uh, almost ending our session. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, I'll try to quickly summarize what we have heard today. Um, I think it is fair to say from what we heard today, the scientific, scientific evidence points to a review of early detection guidelines for prostate cancer across the European Union in order to save life and raise quality of life of prostate cancer patients across the European Union. There are means to do this and they are affordable for the member states from what we have heard today. 
Sharing and pooling of knowledge and expertise on prostate cancer has been done with breast and uh, colorectal cancers would be of great value to the community. So we hope this will be an area the European uh, Commission will be able to, uh, to include in its cancer plan. On, and the intergroup on cancer, uh, Challenge Cancer, is, which is also uh, sponsoring this event, would of course be happy to make sure that um, this important issue is followed from the European Parliament side. Uh, I myself, I'm a substitute member in the new um, Beating Cancer Committee, and I will also follow the debate on the EU cancer plan closely to ensure that prostate cancer gains the attention it deserves. It is also fantastic to have a clear link with the EU cancer mission and to know that projects can support the development of evidence-based approaches to early detection of prostate cancer too. So from my side, thank you very much for all the experts. For me personally, it was very informative. Okay, thank you very much. And now we are really coming to the close of our meeting. And I want to thank all, all our panelists who have given us an, a view and their view on this very important issue. And as I told you at the start, I am a patient and I can make assure you that whenever asked to collaborate in any fashion to improve or to contribute to the research and to um, bring this important issue of early detection and bring it to work in the different member states, you can count on us. And on the other hand, we will be watching all of you, whether or not you lose your interest in our disease and in early detection so that we can, in fact, continue to save lives and especially to save a lot of comorbidities that are so bad for the quality of life of us patients. And I thank you all and over to Yarka. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank all the panelists uh, for their great contributions to the program. Um, I think this is clearly a sign that um, uh, we are not there when it comes to prostate cancer awareness, and we still have a way to go, but we are well on our way. And um, as Gregor already said, uh, it, it takes a long way to work together, and um, um, we are really there. Um, uh, as I said before, this webinar will be recorded, and as you know, all the website, all the uh, presentations will be uploaded to the website. Um, thanks all for joining and hopefully next time we can meet in person again. Have a lovely evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.